this week's episode, I'm going to go through with you the top five books that I think should be on your Black Friday and Christmas Amazon list. So let's get to it. So first that's on the list is Death in 10 Minutes by Fern Riddell. And that is the story of Kitty Marion, who in the author's own words on the front cover of the book, highlighted as suffragette, arsonist, and activist. It follows the story of this music hall performer and her subsequent radicalism during the suffragette movement, but not only that, beyond that, into her active campaigning as one of the early birth control campaigners as well. And there are a number of aspects of this book that really stand out for it, and reasons why I enjoyed reading it and that I think you should as well. Now, the first amongst those is that it really departs from the usual suffragette narrative that appears in a lot of books and on a lot of documentaries. Kitty Marion was not a suffragist marching down the uh, London roads wearing green, white and purple, carrying her Votes for Women banner and occasionally smashing the odd window. No, Kitty Marion was an mm. serious performer. This is a woman who was posting explosives through the post. She was planting nail bombs. She was setting fire to houses. A very different kind of suffragette altogether. And thankfully, the book does not even attempt to hide from this or sanitise it. It doesn't attempt to apologise for it, justify it, or in fact, condemn it either. It merely goes to tell the story of this very darker side of the suffragette movement. Secondly, it continues this departure as well by not really painting the Pankhursts in the kind of light that we've come to believe. Now, that's not to say that they don't have their pluses, that they weren't important, but the thing is that they have their flaws. And Dr. Adele's book very much exposes all the flaws of all the people that she chooses to celebrate. And in particular with the Pankhursts, the case of their turning their back on Kitty Marion and their subsequent betrayal when she becomes a later birth control campaigner, something that they were looking to oppose. A particularly acidic quote that comes from the book, which reads, How easy it is for those who want for little to decide what is right and good for those who are in need of so much. The book itself is really well written. It flows really easily and it's an absolute page turner. It doesn't get bogged down in unnecessary details or explanations or background setting. It does expect the reader to know what the suffragette movement is generally about. And that's another reason why I like it as well. We don't need another book explaining why votes for women was needed. We all know that. This is a story very much of the hard hitting campaign of the horrors and the heroism that goes along with the suffragette movement. It's filled with shocking twists, it's filled with shocking tortures, and it's filled with really quite eye-opening details. It's the first one of Dr. Riddell's books that I've read, but I assure you, it's not going to be the last. Our second recommendation is The Spy and the Traitor by Ben McIntyre. And this is the story of Oleg Gordievsky, the highest placed double agent we've ever had inside the KGB. Now, the book's tagline states this as the greatest espionage story of the Cold War. By God, it's not wrong. The book's prologue opens up and starts with the very moment that Gordievsky realises that the KGB are onto him. And then, cutting back to start to explain how that story comes about, it's got you absolutely hooked from there. It's a weighty book. It covers Gordievsky's career from joining the KGB, but you're hooked all the way through his disillusionment with communism, his work for the British intelligence, his arrest in Moscow, and a heart-stopping MI6 operation to spring him right from under the noses of the Russians. And you're with him all the way, understanding what he has to give up, because the level of detail in it is not overpowering, but essential. And it guides you along, creating a picture of a man who you can relate to, even though you are not a spy chief for the Russians, you can still relate to what he has to give up and what dangers that he's in. It's an absolute page turner, seriously. When you get into the last 30% of the book, you need to make sure that you've got nothing booked in your diary and there's nothing important that you need to be doing because you will not be putting this book down. And as well as that, what makes it even better 
It's a true story told with suspense and wit. Honestly, if you're not even into Cold War or Spies, I still can't recommend this book enough. Third on the list is Burma 44 by James Holland, a historian we've worked with over the past few years at the Chalk Valley History Festival. He's also a co-host of the very popular We Have Ways of Making You Talk podcast. Now his book, Burma 44, covers the first real victory the British Army had over the Japanese in World War II, the Battle of the Admin Box. And this really is the Rourke's drift of the Second World War. What James Holland does well in Burma 44 is take that grand scale of the war in the Far East and explore its detail and its background so that you thoroughly understand the situation that those soldiers were in. And don't forget, this is a war that was fought by the end of it for with every weapon from knives all the way up to atom bombs. What he then does is take that narrative and bring it right back down to the scale of this small, overlooked, overshadowed battle in the Arakan region where, as the book states, a ragtag collection of clerks, drivers, doctors, muleteers and a few dogged Yorkshiremen stopped the Imperial Japanese Army in its tracks. Once the battle starts, the action is thick, fast and brutal. And you've got graphic descriptions of both heroism and horror, including even one section where the rate of grenades that need to be thrown to hold the Japanese back involves a system of one man pulls the pin while another man throws the grenade. And all the time you're being reminded that these are real people on the other side of the real world, experiencing what for many were their real teenage years. It's really breathtaking stuff. It's refreshing to see a book that covers a much smaller scale than James's usual books. And while his larger scale books such as Normandy 44 and Big Week are excellent, I do hope he will cover some more smaller scale ones in the future as well. He's good at them. Fourth up is The Butchering Art. The Butchering Art is the first book by medical historian Lindsay Fitzharris and it covers the Victorian surgeon Joseph Lister and his quest to clean up Victorian surgery. And we do mean clean it up. This is the story of Lister's dogged work to reduce patient deaths from post-operative infections at a time when germ theory was just fake news. What I particularly like about this book is that it accepts Victorian surgery for what it was at the time. The author doesn't feel the need to berate Victorian surgeons for what seem now to be barbaric ways, nor does she seek to judge them by 21st century standards. Um, in fact, she's been on record as saying that in 200 years time, there will be things about modern medicine that the time, the people of the time will look back on and laugh. She also doesn't look to frame Lister's discovery and work with antiseptic as some form of miracle cure that's constantly beset by stuffy old fashioned establishment opposition, as you seem to find a lot with the story of Jon Snow and public health and cholera. Dr Fitzharris outlines the logical steps that a scientist takes to reach a conclusion and then sell that conclusion like a scientist two other scientists. That's a very refreshing approach. Beware though, it's graphic stuff. There are some really rather brutal examples and descriptions of Victorian surgery and the gruesome life of a Victorian anatomy student. There were a few occasions where even I had to put the book down and just make sure that my stomach was settled. But if you're going to buy a book on Victorian surgery and amputation, frankly, you should know what you're signing up for. The book is really easy to follow and just flows along really nicely. You don't need to be a medic, an anatomist, a surgeon or a historian even to follow the logical steps that Lister is taking. It's easy to understand, it's easy to stay with and it throws open the life of one of the pioneers of modern surgery whose mark we're still feeling today. So this is Dr Fitzharris's first book. I do really hope it's not her last. I believe at the moment she's also working on a history of plastic surgery. But Butchering Art by Lindsay Fitzharris. Get that on the list. Well last on the list but by no means least is a book that neither myself nor Kyle have shut up about in a year ever since stumbling across it. I swear I've lost friends over this because I just nag everybody to read it so much. And the book I'm talking about is The Five by Hallie Rubenhold. 
Five is basically the life stories of the canonical five victims of Jack the Ripper. And it comes from the basic premise that their lives have got to be more interesting than their deaths. And in doing so, this throws open such beautiful, rich tapestry of detail about the lives of the Victorian poor, the lives of the Victorian homeless, and the lives of the Victorian addicted, which are pretty much the three things, as well as their deaths, that all five have in common. Because there is little evidence that any of these women, apart from Mary Kelly, were prostitutes in London at any time in their lives. The picture painted of these lives include, for some, times of plenty and times of joy, tempered by times of conflict, addiction and desperation. And this all weaves together into five emotional stories that can be sometimes quite upsetting. And so it should be. There are times I'd had to put the book down and just recover my emotions because it's that powerfully written stuff. The book has really changed the way that I look at the Jack the Ripper murders and I'll confess has made me focus more on the women than the killer. In fact I don't think I've even got an interest anymore in who Jack the Ripper actually was but I've got very much interest in the five women that he killed and I'll continue to nag all of you to read it. For as the author says they were daughters, wives, mothers, sisters and lovers. They were women, they were human beings and that should mean something. Thanks very much for watching. That's our first video on uh, book recommendations. Uh, we have placed the direct Amazon links into the descriptions at the bottom uh, if you want to buy these for yourselves and we really would recommend that you do so. So join us in a few weeks time when you'll see um, Kyle's five recommendations. But until then, happy shopping, happy Black Friday. Keep well. Bye bye.